Welcome to the This Ability Adventures podcast. I'm Andrea Anderson. And I'm Chip Dodd from Team This Ability. Hi, I am Chip Dodd with Team This Ability, and I am here with some amazing people to do the race ramble for the fall foliage adventure race that just happened uh, last weekend, which would have been roughly, I don't know, uh, October 21st or 2nd in that general time frame. I'm here with Justin Mann, who we raced with for the first time ever. We also have Jesse Hagberg. Uh, he's raced with Team This Ability before, raced under a different name this time, but we are looking forward to racing with him again soon in the future. Um, and also an extra special guest, Alan Wagner, the race director of the Fall Foliage from Broad Run Off-Road. And so we're looking to get some uh, some tidbits from behind the scenes of what really happened during the race. Um, so Alan, let's start off with you. Like, tell us about this race. How long was it? What was the race schematic? Just so that people that didn't attend or didn't get a chance to dot watch, uh, what did they miss out on? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, I'm the race director for Broad Run Off Road. I think most people know us at this point in the adventure racing scene, but for those who don't, we started out doing like beginner races. So our first race was just a five hour. That was it. Then our second race, I think was just a three hour. And then we've kind of evolved from there where we've become like a ladder system for our racers where they said, Hey, make something a little bit longer. So then we threw in a, a nine hour and a 10 hour. And then in the last two years, very specifically, we've had a lot of racers who said, I want to try nighttime, but I don't want to go all the way through for 24 hours through the morning. Like they don't want to work with sleep deprivation. So last year for the first time down in Fredericksburg, we did our fall foliage race and we went till midnight. Like we went from morning to midnight. So they got a good, four or five hours of dark. And this was basically a repeat of that with some slight adjustments. We only stopped at 10 o'clock on this one. Um, and that's actually a, a funny story about how the schematics schematics go for the race. Um, the intention, um, I've, I've been putting on races for about 10 years now, and it does take a lot of work. I, I know a lot of people might not be aware of it, but I've actually, the races on Saturday, I was out there since Monday, setting legs or meeting vendors for delivering of boats and, you know, doing what park and all that kind of stuff so after doing this for 10 years i actually originally was gonna like this is gonna be my off year so for spring bloom this year we just did a five-hour race and originally this race was only supposed to be a i think a four hour and a six hour or something like that um and originally my plan was to do it down at mason next state park nobody had ever done an adventure race there from what i had seen but the big issue was that mason next state park while they were open to us being on the property they didn't like the idea of having like 200 cars parked there. They, it's a very popular park during the day. You probably noticed this during the race that there were a lot of people picnicking and barbecuing and stuff in there. So they were like, look, we have no problem with the number of races you're going to have in here, but is there a way you can just not start here? And we're just somewhere in the middle of the race. So I knew from being in this area that the Quantico Orienteering Club had done meets at uh, Gunston Hall before. It's called George Mason's Gunston Hall. It's the historical home of George Mason, Virginia's founding, like the Virginia, uh, I guess you could, not the Declaration, or the Constitution for the state of Virginia, yep. that eventually influenced the, you know, the, the United States Constitution and everything. But long story short is they had done O-Meets there before, so I reached out to them, and they were super into the idea. They loved it. So like, great, we're going to do the race here. And Mark Garrison from USARA had reached out to me at one point and he's like, hey, we're really looking to find like a fall regional qualifier for USARA. I saw you just did a 15 hour. Would you be willing to do one again? And from there it became, OK, I guess we're doing this again. So then it became a matter of like planning out the course. So what I'd really like to do with the races is. I, I wanted to for this race because it was a regional qualifier, I felt like I had to kind of step it up at least in terms of like the difficulty of the course like obviously nighttime was going to be a play but for folks who aren't aware three of the areas kind of four of the areas that this was in are places that o meets have happened before in the past so this was almost like an ode to orienteering there were three big trek legs in this race and what i tried to do is i tried to make it so that the race progressively got harder as it went so the first bike leg was go in sequential order, get all the points in order. It was almost like you don't need to think. And that then you got to a paddle leg, which was a little bit of like thinking about which order you wanted to go in. 
then the next trek leg uh, the the one that was in pohick bay and meadowwood and and i can actually bring it up on my screen for our, yeah, our definitely viewers screen here share. some people watch on um, youtube so. yeah yeah <laughs> although it progressively got harder there were some hard parts of each yeah. leg i'm just saying it uh... yeah here we go we're on the screen all right so so the first leg was you started at gunston hall you rode all the way up to meadowwood the trick at meadowwood though is um when people think of meadowwood they probably think of sorry i'm gonna bring this up this is what people think of and they live in this area this is what meadowwood is it's it's a very mountain bike specific place that has a lot of wooden features in it um and it's very very popular i would say with locals so it was important and and the agreement is managed by the bureau of land management and blm basically said they're first before the general public gets here so that's why we went went biking there first was to get you guys there before everybody else woke up and realized it was a beautiful day. Um, sure. The trick to Meadowwood is that it's got multiple one way trails in it, so it required people to do some interesting loops. So you'll see in kind of the route here, and maybe it'll display better if I go on to the topo map. Um, so you couldn't just go get point 102. You had to ride past it because the entrance to that trail is down here at the bottom. And then you ride the, this is called the boss trail, and you rode it back up. And that was very clear in the rules. We said you have to go the correct way on the one-way trails. You couldn't do any bushwhacking. That was part of our permit with BLM. They did not want people bushwhacking in the mountain bike area. And again, that just has to do with how popular the park is. So there was that one. There's one down here called Yard Sale which is probably one of my favorite bike trails to ever ride on. It's basically just a never-ending series of tabletops. Um, if you know anything about mountain biking, you're just constantly going up and down and getting momentum and going up and down again repeatedly. And then randomly in the middle of the trail is like an old car, like just car parts to this car. So we're like, that's got to be a flag. But once you did that, you got out and you rode your way to this TA here, um, which was in pohick bay regional park so now we've already gone to our second park at this point you had to trek your way down to the boat launch and here this is the boat leg so you had one two three and then as you got further into the marshes four five on this map in particular it looks very simple but all you have to do is look at a satellite map and you realize that this is not an easy thing to go do. So if you look at like the aerial imagery, you'll see that this whole thing is loaded with vegetation and there's not, and you can't just go from point 209 straight to 211, even though this is all on a regular map marked, you can see there's very clear channels in between the lily pads. So that's where it became navigating on a boat. Um, Actually, if you look at some of the tracks, some of the teams actually did make it from this connector to this connector and, and went straight through. But what was really interesting is that depending on the tide, like the time of the day, this becomes a very undoable paddle. Um, I could regale you guys with the stories I have from myself because I accidentally set this one at low tide and I basically pulled the boat more than I probably paddled the boat when I set this one. But after you did that, then became the first real serious trek leg. It was not short. I think I estimated this one at almost three hours at a, at a quick team pace. There were some teams who were on this trek leg, I think, for almost five, six hours, depending on if you were trying to clear it. It's a very defined trail system in Pohick Bay. And then you can eventually cross the street. And there's more to Meadowwood out here. So there were more points out here. You can kind of see on the map as well. Um, but the reason I kind of said this was the easier of them is because you'll notice almost all of the points, I would say, are within 100 feet of the trail. Uh, I think the furthest one away might have been 317. But you can see it's kind of surrounded by trail, at least almost in a crescent around it. So you've got pretty easy catches on a lot of these points. Like, oh, if I miss that, then I'm eventually going to run into the trail over here. If I'm diving off in this trail to get this one, eventually I'll run into this trail. So that's why I kind of claimed that it was the easiest of the trek points, but it was easily the longest of the trek uh, sections. I mean, it was really cool about that. So then after that, people would get on their bikes and they would... Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to jump in real quick. One thing I liked what you did there, and I wish all race directors would do it, since it's kind of Rogan style, every team had the choice. Do we do the other side of the road first or this side? And we do clockwise or counterclockwise. And then even within those decisions, 
do I go get what 3 20 on the way from 323 to 322, or do I do it on the road? I mean, yeah, you had many, many route choices and strategies, and lots of teams chose lots of different ways. And so, that I, I love that way better than a linear, it's obvious, you just have to go fast. I mean, I love it when you pass a team and you have no idea. Are they in front of you or are you in front of them? I I just don't know, you know. And and what got interesting from our perspective from tracking is at the beginning of the race, you guys were kind of more, I think, I think in fifth or sixth at the onset of the race. It was basically Bash Brothers, Glenn and Kevin from Strong Machine versus the Tubbs, Jesse Tubb and Evan Tubb. And they were neck and neck. Basically, they finished the first bike leg, I think, like 30 seconds apart from each other. And then they finished the paddle like a minute apart from each other. But then very immediately, they both went for 13. But then after 13, Bash Brothers just went across the street and decided to do the Meadowwood portion first. And uh, the Tubbs decided to do this section first. So it became a very clear counterclockwise versus clockwise thing and they weren't like popping off of each other anymore at that point it became who's going to do what and what order they're going to go in there were also some in the design and and we do do this as race directors where like it's not always very clear oh this is definitely the route we got to go and like for this race it was 315 and 316 that there wasn't an easy way to make it part of your route Right. They were just inconveniently placed and you had to decide when to go get them and come back. The green route you see here is the is the way I was setting the points. But that doesn't necessarily mean it was the most efficient way. I saw a lot of teams get 17, go get 18, 19. They went and did the Meadowood side. Then they got 16 and 15 on their way back to T.A. So there's all kinds of different ways to attack them. And that's kind of what I like them to design of this is that navigationally it should be easy to find these points but what's the most efficient way i think we've got like 20 different ways we saw people do it during the race so cool yep yeah that's a well-designed course that i think for the navigators out there they love that is that it's it's not obvious and you place the points such that it, it, it literally who knows it, it really would take the same team trying each route at the same you know, there's there's no yeah. way to tell which way was the best way because it they were so close. Um, well, yeah. the other thing I liked about the design and this for the whole race that each leg seemed like a mini O course, like they were quick and the points were, you know, we were getting them about every 15 minutes. I think Justin did some math for us and we got them every 13 and a half minutes or something like that. So that's really keeps you motivated and keeps you on your game and. I loved that part of the design too. Oh, I'm happy to hear that. I actually do that when I design the courses. I try to make it so you're getting a point every 15 or 20 minutes because I know I've done races where I've gone hours without getting a point and I know how that feels mentally and I like giving people that dopamine rush and what I what I actually did for this race is I called Mark Harris and I said, how many punches can I fit on a SI card? He told me it was 55. So I said, well, we're putting 53 checkpoints in the race. 54 is the finish line and that gave people one space if they cleared the course that they could accidentally punch one twice <laughs> that may be why i stopped like... working because i punched a one twice maybe three times <laughs> that, that's so funny justin was like no it worked <laughs> but yeah so so that was kind of the theme of one right the the first trek leg leg three the first trek leg the theme there was kind of just really big what order are you going to go in then not not boring from a sense of what you saw there's a beautiful trail they call it the high point trail it just hugs this road and takes you all the way down into mason neck state park it's paved all the way there so yeah it's not single track or anything like that but it's a beautiful gorgeous trail that brings you down into that area and what's interesting about mason neck state park versus say pohick bay is topographically it is as flat as a pancake. So it is completely different navigationally on how you like, I don't know if you can tell I've got the contour lines on, there just aren't any out here. So it was flat. when you get to this park, it really became a different navigational exercise. I think if I put it at the 10 foot layer, that's what was on the race maps. So, but even then there's not really a whole lot to work with. 
And but what's interesting about Mason Neck is it's all it's got this inner creek here called Canes Creek. So that's where I had people paddle. I'll talk about that in a second. But from the trek perspective, it's not really easy to cut these inlets because almost all the inlets are completely full of marsh and weeds and like waist high water. So you would go there like I know when I set this point the first time, I tried to just cut across here and I saw it. And I was like, you know what? Never mind. I'm going back to the trail. Like, That's not doable. So it was going to force people to put in a lot of mileage, even though this was on the trail. This is just barely off the trail. The real navigating became 36, 37, 38, 39, and 40. And the exercise here really became 36 was a shoot off the trail with a bearing. Then it was... You think you could shoot to 37, but then you're going to find out that none of this was navigable. So you even this green line is probably cutting it too short. You really kind of had to come all the way down here to come around for it. But 38 and 39, I think might have been my two favorite points of the day um, in the fact that this was like this was I, I'm, an, I'm an orienteer at heart and setting a bearing is what it's really about. And the only way to get 39 was to set a bearing. There were no features around it, really. On the map, it shows as a stream, but I think that stream's been gone for decades. Oh, it was gone. And confirmed. So yeah. the, the interesting thing was if you went in a clockwise fashion, you got an advantage because 38 is closer than, say, 40 was to it. But also 38 was on this old utility line that I found, and there's little orange, like, stakes in the ground that basically brought you right to 38 if you knew what you were looking at. So it gave you a really confident place to set a bearing from. You could set that bearing and kind of go out here. When you found that stream, like you could tell it was an old stream, like it didn't have water actively in it and it's completely flat, but it distinctively, the ground was different. So you could kind of tell you were in the right area. If you look at the tracks, this is easily where we had the most navigation hiccups. There were people who were setting bearings and they ended up over on this gravel road because they just blew past it and just kept going. And that was kind of the, the point of this one is that it was not only bearings, but it was kind of pace counting. So it was like, you got to be good at those two things if you wanted 39. Yep. Bar pace and counting. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a long pace count. I mean, I think it was like, it, we we did it counterclockwise. And I think we were trying to go from 40 to 39. We aimed off slightly to the north, thinking that we're going to see that stream. Blew right past the stream because there ain't no damn stream. <laughs> and then we we finally got to the next re-entrant, which is just south of 38. And we were like, whoa, wait a second. But we were timing it. because pace counting pace is count really hard. Well. Oh, no, because no, no, that was that 750 one. meters. Because it was like 750. Yeah, okay. So that's too much to pace count through the woods and have any accuracy. So we were yeah. timing it. We knew that we had gone too far. And then... But if you did it clockwise from 38 to 39, you could basically follow that reentrant down, yeah. hit the stream, turn right, and you hit it. So Yeah, uh, so that's a, full, that's a full kilometer between 40 and 39. Yeah. Okay. Right. That's a long so. pace count through the woods bushwhacking, <laughs> right? At this point, you're yeah. trying to do terrain, and there isn't any terrain. So, yeah, it's which exactly. dry stream slight depression is the right one. Although, <laughs> to be fair, we should have read the clue. <laughs> Because the clue yeah. said dry, I think, with the question mark or something. And we didn't read the clue. That's right. one of the Yeah, the, we didn't read the, the day clue. I printed those rules was right when we had had the hurricane and all the rain. So I was like, oh, this has been dry for years, but maybe it'll have water in it again. I don't know. We'll right. see what it looks like when we get out there. And I knew that both of these paddles couldn't be at high tide. So I kind of had to flip a coin on it. And Pohick. I'll, I'll be completely honest with you. I wouldn't put, put people in Pohick at low tide. It's that bad. Like, it's basically you're walking in mud knee deep. I tested both of them kind of at low tide. I could at least stay in my boat and do this paddle. It wasn't a full paddle. I had to, like, push through the mud in some spots, but I didn't have to get out of the boat. So that's why this picked the second paddle. But... This was a straight, I would say, relatively easy paddle because it was also part of the four-hour race. All of the points were on the shore side, but the pictures I have from the four-hour race doing this paddle versus the pictures I have of the 14-hour people doing this paddle are completely starkly different. Um, what's probably most interesting is right at the boat put in, there's an old pier post, and during the four-hour race, I think it's like two feet 
in the water. And when you guys were putting in for the 14 hour race, it was completely dry. So that tells you how big the shift in the water is during, during the day. Wow. So I had a lot of people were like, it was pretty, but that was not an easy paddle. And I was like, that was kind of the intent, but you know, it was at least paddleable in low tide. So kind of going from there to then, so you did that paddle and then you did Mason neck, depending on your timing, the sun may have been setting on you, depending on if you were a slower team, it might've already been dark when you were out at Mason neck, but whenever you were done, you came back to Gunston hall and from a race director behind the scenes standpoint, it was because they were the ones who gave me permission to do orienteering at night. But the thing I actually loved most about doing this, this at night is that there are basically no trails in the system. If I take this off for a second so you can see it, there is basically this one main trail that will take you out here to a scenic view. And there's kind of a trail here to take you to this cliff side. And that's it. So everything else, you can see all the points out here. This is all completely trailless out here. This area up here is completely trailless. This area back here is completely trailless. So when I was saying it was progressively getting harder, now we're really talking about people who have to be able to navigate. And it's nighttime because now we're done with trails being catches. Now topography is the catch that you have at this point. And then genuinely... When I did the original course estimates, I kept coming in really quick. I was coming in at around like 12 hours, stuff like that. And, and just really openly, that's how the UTM plotting got added to this league. And it's also how you don't get mapped until the race start got added to this race. Because I needed ways to kind of add time into the race to get it to be longer. So right. what we did is 45... 47, 49, and 52. The ones that were the furthest away from the trails were the ones that we made people plot for two reasons. One, we, we wanted it so that they couldn't accidentally find the flags. But secondarily, they were the ones that were on obvious features, like topographic features. This one's on a saddle that is very easy to see on the map. You can see a high point here, a high point here. We put it in the middle of them. The one out here was at this high point at the end of this kind of like L-shaped ridge that comes out. The one over here was on this like little finger spur. And then the one over here was on this really obvious spur that you can see here. And we do that because when people are plotting, I know not all the races do this, but I like to make it so that when you're plotting, you can tell if you're in the right spot. Um, you know, like, oh, the clue says spur. I plotted it and I'm not on a spur. And that's the way I mentally think about it. And what was so interesting <laughs> is I watched so many racers come in plotted the point wrong and i could hear them talking to themselves out loud going well i guess that could be a spur <laughs> and i'm just like <laughs> and it's just like that should be your clue that it's not in the right spot <laughs> but what is really interesting about the whole gunston hall area is that all of this is all historical home site so not all the buildings and stuff are still here but a lot of ruins are in this area so 745, I can, I think I actually have a picture of these things, was an old ruin. It's a, it's a ruin from where like the home site used to be. I like to take pictures of all of the uh, checkpoints as I'm out there. When I set them, I'm like making sure I am in the right spot. Here's Gunston Hall. So that leg is also where the, the big depression was yeah yeah so, yeah. so here way. here's the in the daytime this is what it looks like so it's an old ruin wall that is out there so you think you're just navigating to the spur but it's very obvious when you that there's an old rock ruin wall out there um you get to some others this was one of our quad trees where it's like four trees growing out of the original tree we're in a spot uh, we had a couple of those on the course distinct tree was a hint i think a few times the picture doesn't do it justice, but this is the massive depression. Uh, it's a giant <laughs> hole that's out there. Um, that's it from two different spots. What's really interesting about this one, and I, I'd love to hear some of the stories you guys have about it, but there are sometimes when I'm doing research as a race director, I do it on the map before I even get out there. And two things I like to do, and, and I'm, I'm in CalTapo uh, as an app if nobody's ever seen it before. 
one of the things you can do is you can say, hey, show me old USGS maps. So that's what I'm looking at here now. So now I can see like maybe what used to be in the area. This one doesn't really tell me too much. But then you can also go to something called shaded relief, which is LIDAR data, like they fly a plane over and they're basically doing a laser to figure out what the elevations are. And there were two things that stuck out to me. One was that is a very straight line. There's no way that's not man-made. Yep. And sure enough, when I went out there, it's an old road. And if you could find it, it was really easy to navigate on. So I actually added that to the map for the racers. If they noticed it, they could see that road on the map. But what really stuck out to me is this is that area. Hold on, we're trying to disappear, make that disappear for a second. This is clearly something man-made here. That's perfect yeah. right angles. It's definitely dropping down an elevation every couple feet. In my dream world, I was like, oh, I hope this is like an old foundation of an old house. Maybe it's like an old abandoned house or something like that. The road basically drives right into it. You can see mounds of dirt. You can see a big hole here. So maybe it was like a digging site. So when I went out to scout this area, I came out. I was pretty disappointed when I found this because all the foundation and any kind of like cement or brick or anything is all completely removed. You go to this area and it's all grass and it just you go down and then it just drops down like seven feet and then it goes flat and then it drops down seven feet. It clearly used to be an old home site. But it didn't, if I called it like ruins or anything like that, nobody would be able to catch it as a feature. Like it wouldn't be something that somebody could catch. So I ended up going over to this giant hole over here. And I was like, great, I'll set it in there. At least then I can say massive hole depression. And that hole is not insignificant. I think I measured it at about 40, 45 feet wide. And I got in it at one point and it was over my head and I'm, I'm six foot three. So it was not an insignificantly sized hole. No, I think in in historic times, uh, based on um, going to uh, what's the the state park with the Buff Betty, the Okanichi State Park, they said that a lot of the old old homesteads built like a cone shaped hole. They packed ice into it with hay, and it kind of keeps the ice for a really long period of time. But that's also where uh, we we found the what looks like a wine cellar or something, but it's like a brick like thing. And, and, you know, it said depression, but we were like, whatever, we're just sending Andrea in because she's the smallest and it's scary. And so we sent her in to this <laughs> wine cellar, which is that divot just to the west of that. Yeah. Hole. Yeah. That little thing right there. I, yeah. I know where I'm going soon when I get a day yeah. off is I'm going back to check that out because I've been out to that site probably five times at this point And I had never seen that on well, all the times I was out there. You'll be as surprised as we were that there was a depression above it. Because we went to that point thinking, oh, we're here. It should be right here. And we see this cellar-like thing. And we realize it's not a depression. So we just kept going. And then we had to backtrack. And it really surprised all of us that there's a depression right above this cellar feature. So, And I also fell in a hole mm -hmm. there. There's like a square, um, almost like a chimney yeah. coming from that. And so it's a square shape just about the size of my foot. So my shoe got stuck. Say, this, is, this is your actual track from the race. So. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Well, you'll see us go right past that, you know, right past the point yeah. and then come right back to it. Yeah. So yep. we were just, we, yeah, we had no idea there was a, de a depression above that entry to that cellar. And the other thing, we caught yeah. this on the GoPro. So when the video comes out, which will probably be tomorrow, Anybody that's listening to this, like watch our video and you'll see us go into the little cellar and then Andrea bust her ass and fall into the hole. And they're like, don't pull my foot. I can pull my shoe because her shoe is like stuck in this hole. That was it was brick. It was it, it was actually a chimney for that little cellar, like an air hole. And her shoe just got jammed into it. So I'm like pulling on her shoe, trying to get her out. It's, I it's pretty entertaining. so many times this race. That was probably my second or third or whatever. I was starting to. Yeah, I'm starting to hurt. Yeah. After. yeah, so I mean, so that that was the course in general. Even this was our eighth adventure race that we've put on now. Um, I think the big things for people is we didn't give them the maps until the start of the race. That was kind of a new thing. The UTM plotting was a new thing. So we threw a couple of little things in there. What I was interested to see as a race director, too, is I was throwing in some hints in there to people of things that I knew would trip them up. And some paid attention and some didn't. Right. So. 
before the race, one of the big things I told him about the UTM plotting is I said, hey, you're plotting at one by 10,000, which I don't know I, that I've ever seen a race plot at that zoomed in of a level. And the reason I kept mentioning it is because if you've ever if you've never plotted that that level before, the grids are all half a kilometer, whereas on one by 20, one by 24, one, like all the other ones, all the grid squares are generally a kilometer. So everyone, you know, even including top teams were getting tripped up. They're like, you know, the way grid plotting works is that you just go get you get a number one through 10 and it just tells you how far on the grid you need to go over. And everybody kept going, man, it's not in the right spot. And it's because you're going one, two, three, four, five, go to the next grid box, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And that was tripping up a lot of people. The second thing that I was interested in from the race director side of things is we we gave everybody a, a sheet at check-in because there was another event going on that day, the Tour de Mount Vernon, which was riding their cyclists all through the area. So I needed to warn people that that was going on because I didn't want them to run into these. Um, but the other thing I put in that sheet is I said, hey, I'm just letting you know, the biking is first and it has to be in sequential order. And part of that is I am trying to help people get ready. Also, it was kind of hint, hint, you can't take off. Like you don't need to pre-plan a whole map of the whole course. You can just look at the first point and go because at least when you got the rules, the first seven points were in that first leg. It was point to point because you had to go one, two, three, four, five. So it was interesting when some people were like just blown away when a bunch of teams took off as soon as we got the maps. And to me, I was like, I'm surprised more teams didn't figure that out and realize, oh, we can just take off. We don't we can kind of map plan. I talked to to some of the teams and they were map planning on their ride out to checkpoint one. Like they were like, all right, I'm just on this kind of sidewalk trail. Now I can just look at the map as I'm on my way out there and figure out kind of some of the other legs and what to do. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It was just, I was, it was interesting to me that maybe more teams didn't take that approach. Yeah, I think um, maybe it's almost time to introduce Jesse too, because I think, you know, Team Awesome Sauce and our team had a completely different strategy from the get go. And just what you're saying, we took off and, I don't know, Jesse, do you want to talk about how your team took off, started your race? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we we started the race. I think we saw a bunch of teams dash out. Our plan from the beginning was to uh, to to take a look at the maps and figure out if we we're going to plan or go. And because there were those uh, directional trails in the first bit, we're like, okay, we, we got to plan this. And then we started, as we were planning, we started talking uh, about the fact that our our minds will never be as clear as they are right now with low heart rate and you know like we have the adrenaline rush of like green light go but still we're not fatigued and tired so um we actually before the race start pulled our table over to the area and had like mapping tools and you know distance measurement tools out grabbed the maps threw them on the table and then pretty thoroughly planned um i would say all of all of the definitely all the the biking um, and the trekking, at least the routes we wanted to take and kind of basic uh, distances, but we wanted to treat the tracks like like an orienteering course where you just like draw a straight line between okay we're gonna go this way one to two two to five five to three and then we would read it in real time depending on what terrain we saw. So it I, I think in hindsight we would probably go back and just probably plan the first bike and the rest of it and maybe maybe just our, our routes but probably be a little looser about some of the other stages it, i say it took us about 20 minutes before we got out of the start line and alan was like swinging by like you guys better go Let, let's get go chop 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 it did, <laughs> so yeah it did what did you guys do a little bit of time to decide um basically to look at the overview to see how the maps, uh, you know, connected together. That's what we spent the most time with. But then, you know, Chip is really good at looking at his map board and biking at the same time. And um, knowing it was in order, I think also we're just like, okay, we're going to go. Um, yeah, so we, we took off right away. In fact, I think I was the last. I know, like, oh, I was, it was driving already. me crazy. Like when, once we figured out how the maps fit together and that new yeah. first section was directional and you had to do them in order. And I was like, 
this is a no-brainer. We need to be ready to roll. And so I'm up there with Glenn and everybody else, like ready, like the minute you said go, I'm ready to hammer. And I'm looking back and <laughs> Justin like, and Andrew are like fiddling with their helmet. I'm like, come on, let's go. Like, I got this. Let's let's move. But the other cool part was uh, you know, the first thing was a bike, and then we got over to the trek and we went to the paddle. So on the paddle, you know, I'm like, hey, let's navigate, hey, hit that tree. And that gave me 10 minutes to sit there and look at the map and study the next trek section. So I had mm. that 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 concentrated time to work on it. Do I do clockwise or counterclockwise or this or that? Um, because you know, the, the, you know, when you wait a boat out, you you do a, you know, you you want the boat like uh, about 60 40 or whatever. And so it worked out where I wasn't in the rear, I was in the front, Andrew's in the middle, Justin's in the back, and it worked perfect. Like I say, Justin hit that tree and I'm studying the map, and then when we popped out of the boat. Justin and I would confer and then, uh, you know, and work on it and say, yeah, let's go this way or that way. This is what I'm thinking. But also, but we were open to changing on the fly as we went, you know, because the. Ooh, so maybe an advantage of a three person team because you could be mapping on the way. Interesting. Yeah. And I'm not sure it was mentioned, but Alan, thank you for letting us all have two sets of maps. Yes. That is just always such a game changer. It just. That's huge. It helps everybody else be involved, and yeah, I just love races. I, where you get two sets. Yeah, I've I've honestly done that every race. I mean, I do it specifically for the learning. Like, even if you're you've got a navigator on your team, you're never going to learn how to navigate unless you have a set of maps in your hand. Yeah. So let's say I'm with Chip, and Chip's navigating the whole race. If I've got a set of maps in my hand, I can follow what Chip's doing. And I'm learning his technique as he's doing it. So that, again, kind of learning has been kind of our big thing with ours and getting people into it. So that's why I've always kind of done the extra set of maps thing. And, and I will continue also... to do so. And other race directors should do so too. Yes. Yeah. And on that note, Justin um, had our second set of maps, you know, 99% of the race and was really helpful with, with Chip. How did that go for you having the second set of maps, Justin? So, yeah, overall went really well, and it was great. Like Chip mentioned, he did some of that macro planning, uh, determining, hey, we're going to do clockwise, counterclockwise, and then we just treated it like an orienteering event, and from uh, point to point, then we might talk about, oh, wait, maybe we should stay high on this one. Oh, let's go low. It's going to be faster. There's a better attack point here, that sort of thing. So I think we did a pretty good job of nabbing on the fly without – totally navigating by committee and wasting a lot of time. Uh, so I think that worked pretty well. Yeah, me too. So um, so let, let's go back over to Jesse. Uh, what, what were your goals in this race? Like you, you had a different team. I'm not sure if you raced with them before, but uh, yeah. What, 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 you know, are you out there party pace, having fun? Are you out there <laughs> you know, like going as fast as possible, trying to kill yourself? Like what, what was the goal going in? So over the last couple of years, I've been trying to go faster and faster and faster. And that's been kind of the, the, I don't know, the, the, I don't know, sole goal. But this race was one thing. It was a get the band back together. So my brother-in-law, Jason Smith, who I've raced with for 15 years and almost more than anybody, he blew his knee into a bag of marbles about two years ago and, and was told he'd never run again. Um, he did that playing mm -hmm. soccer. Um, so he beat the odds. He's been gone through PT and, and came back slowly, worked his way back into training and uh, was able to come finish this race. Uh, my other two teammates are, are close friends, Joe Hall and Amy Hall. Um, Joe, you know, he helped me take second place overall in this race last year. And then Amy, his wife, she's been racing for a couple of years now, but it's um, kind of been on the more like jolly romp in the woods teams and has been ready to step up and try to go fast. So first rule, the first goal was get everybody together and get us all across the finish line uh, as a team. Number one, top thing. Two was to demonstrate the things that I've learned in terms of the gold standard of team communication. Like how do we operate, communicate succinctly, um, distribute our roles and just be very clear about what's happening and what needs to happen. And then it was to push the whole race as much as we could, but staying just inside that, putting the team finish at risk. So yeah, that, that was the goal. And I think we, uh, one, two, and three, we accomplished all of those things. Um, really well, really proud of the, proud of those guys. I think you guys did awesome. It was awesome to see you guys, but more importantly, 
the night before the race, we got to have dinner. So yes, <laughs> it was really cool to be um, with your team and also a couple of others um, just getting together. And it's always fun when you're out there with people, you know, even though you're officially competition, you know, we're all rooting for each other to do well. And, you know, just your goals sound so similar to what our goals have been in the years, you know, for years now. So it's, it's really cool that you guys had such a great race. But I should I'd like say to the, the last goal that the last one that feels important to say that um, we don't always talk about is we all agreed beforehand. We wanted to bring um, like fantastic energy to the race for ourselves and for each other. So we kind of wanted like the awesome sauce ethos is we, when people see us, they they want to recognize us as a team that is congratulating and promoting and cheering on our competitions anytime, day, night, in the woods, wherever, and just kind of bringing that positive energy. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, we're having a blast running through the woods. Like, you know, yeah. it, it doesn't get better than that. That is so true. And I think a lot of teams share that that feeling, you know, like with, almost at the very end of the race, we saw Jesse Tubb and his son. Evan and you know knowing we're pretty close competition at that point and he's making sure we get high fives and um it's just it's such a cool community yeah the other nice. really cool thing Alan like you you had you know our race the longer race and you had like the four and a half hour race and you know we passed by I think we passed by the uh, start finish like five hours in which we were ahead of schedule and all of the four and a half hour teams were coming by us. So we were able to hoot and holler and give them props. I mean, they're kids and you could tell people are brand new to racing. They just look all their Their helmets are crooked and they're on these Bobo bikes. And but we were like, woohoo, you know, we're, we're hollering and, and carrying on passing them. And that, that was a lot I, of fun to or the, I it love it. your top team or not. But you're, you're all of us were kind of commingled. I love that too because I think it inspires a lot of people too. It's like when you go do the 5K and then there's a marathon going too, and you're like, well, maybe I can do the next distance. Maybe I can do the next thing. And yep. I love having those commingles during the races too. We also had some accidental commingling, or I should say, nav errors that led to commingling <laughs> on both sides. We had a four hour team, I think two four hour teams that ended up at the Pohick Bay boat launch. And we were like, you don't even have a map for this area. <laughs> how did you end up here <laughs> and then oh, somebody and, and then conversely so we had at least five or six 14 hour teams that ended up back at start finish looking for ta1 um after the bike leg and i was just like they were like where's this power line i was like in a different park <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oops. oh well we all learn best through our mistakes right yeah <laughs> i won't make that mistake again <laughs> Okay. So yeah, I love that. I also loved we had we had great volunteers for this race. I think I had fifteen people helping for this race. It's it was this was easily the biggest race we've done, not only square footage wise, but we had three hundred and forty racers out there between the two races. Both races had over seventy entries. Um so things could get out of hand at that point, but everything ran so smoothly. Um, I was jumping in and doing transport. I actually, that was an averted disaster for, for team awesome sauce. I almost drove off with, uh, with team awesome sauces, E punch. Um, and oh, that was I, so close. <laughs> as I was driving away, uh, Joe, uh, I believe started running after Alan, stop, Alan, stop. I'm like, what? And he's like, the punch is still in the paddle bag. <laughs> he jumps in, he gets it out of the paddle bag, and then they go off to the track for leg that three. That was a close, but... close call. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. and, and congratulations, because when you say 70 entries, this is not people, that's teams. Yeah. There's like 300 exactly. people on the race, right? Like, it was crazy. Yeah, there were there were 340-something racing at another 15 volunteers, um, you know, Plus all kinds of other things to coordinate boat vendors, porta potty vendors, and all kinds of stuff yeah. that we had to you do had during two the paddle day. Paddle sections during this. Two paddles. Two. This is the second time we've done two paddles in a race, and I'll be honest with you, I love it. Um, I think so many races, the paddle is like a checkbox. They're like, okay, we we got a paddle in, you know. And I kind of focus more on like, let's see, good paddling can we do? So last year we were in Fredericksburg. 
we paddled on the Rappahannock River. And then late at night, we had permission to paddle at night and we put everybody on Mott's Run Reservoir at night because it's a closed reservoir. So for safety standards, it was fine. Um, right now, we're planning a race next year that has two paddles too. Um, I like that because I feel like a lot of races, it's just a token thing that they're trying to squeeze in. And I get it. It's hard to find water. But where we're at, we've got an abundance of water near to a lot of our parks here. So as, as many times as I can do that, I'm going to focus on getting a lot of paddling in. So I know a lot of people joke about how nobody practices paddling. But if you're going to come do broad one off-road, you're going to have to practice your paddling. Good. And, and the other thing, it's hard logistically to put two paddles because you have the top teams that are way in the front. You have the back teams that are way in the back. And then somehow you got to move the boats without anybody running out. So prop yeah, we, that off. we did a lot of pre-timing. We were like, okay, if someone finishes the paddle, what's the quickest they could do leg three? And we're like, that's the window with which we have to get their paddles over to Mason Neck. And then, of course, Glenn and Kevin are like sprinting and then the tubs are sprinting. And we're like, OK, our estimates are too slow. We got to bring their paddles now. We're like, you know, trying to hurry up and get them over there. Thankfully, we got everyone's paddles there in time. At the same time, we're bringing four hour people paddles over to Mesa Neck and then bringing them back to start finish so they can go home. So we're like trying to coordinate, OK, this truck is only for four hour paddles. This truck is only for 14 hour paddles. And let's not mix those up and. Yeah. All those logistics couldn't be done. Uh, thankfully, a lot of the people who are volunteering with us are adventure racers, too. Um, Jeremy Johnson, shout out to him. Uh, Alex Tilsley and David Goose, who just spent two weekends ago volunteering at Nationals, uh, volunteered for us. And they pretty much owned um, they pretty much owned Pohick Bay while Jeremy owned Mason Neck and I owned Gunston was kind of our setup for this weekend. So one thing that was exciting about this race was it was the first USARA uh qualifying race for the national championships and and andrea and i had signed up as a two-person co-ed and then realized shit like we need to like find a third and so we luckily I, jesse was already taken up because he's already a previous disability racer so we we pestered him for a minute and he's like nope i'm already done and justin dude you stepped up like we we we've, we've done orienteering to, like not together but we've we've crossed paths at orienteering we we've planned out some orienteering courses uh we call you and say look we're going for first in the co-ed division like <laughs> like what what how how did that go <laughs> yeah so yeah i appreciate your expectation management cuz you know it was like 2 weeks before the race i'm at work doing my thing Get this text from Chip. It's like, hey man, we need a third. We're gonna do fall foliage and we're going fast and furious. And it's gonna be a suffer fest. Are you in? And, and I thought about a minute or two, I'm like, oh hell yeah, of course I am. And I had I had signed up solo to do the race because my some of my usual partners were unavailable. So I'm just gonna do solo. It's something I like to do from time to time for these adventure races. But I got the message from you. I'm like, oh yeah, like let's go for it. You just did so amazing. Yeah. And, you know, we're not saying is we all live in Virginia Beach or did live in Virginia Beach. And, you know, Justin is kind of new to adventure racing, right? So why don't you tell us about your your adventure racing history? Yeah, sure. So I came to it from orienteering, which I started doing in the pandemic in 2020. And I had seen about adventure racing at the same time but like hey i don't have a bike and there's no races going on in upstate new york where i was at the time so let me put that on the back burner so i started orienteering uh got my nav skills honed as best i could and then i moved to virginia a couple years later and started going to the local central virginia orienteering club meets met you all learned about adventure racing from some real live people which was cool and then I just, it was just momentum. And it started honestly with uh, Fall Foliage two years ago, which was my first adventure race. I just did the little, the, the small race, I guess, this paddle and trek at Mott's Run. And so that was kind of my first taste of multidiscipline navigation race. And then the next year, uh, I'm like, I got to get a bike. People are asking me, some other folks said, like, hey, can you race with us? I'm like, I don't have a bike. I can see Chip. And orienteering meets I'm like hey man have you done an adventure race yet I'm like no I need a bike so <laughs> got a bike and started signing up for races and 
never turn back. And speaking of those bike skills, you are a really good mountain biker, but had a pretty hellacious fall. Um, <laughs> so if you're listening, our video is going to come out pretty soon. And sometimes we get lucky where the camera is actually on when something exciting happens. And uh, when you watch it, I feel like I might have been a little too excited that I actually caught it on <laughs> GoPro. <laughs> so I feel like I need to apologize. I did ask, like, are you OK? And you did say yes. But then the very next thing I do is say, oh, I got it on the GoPro. Got it on the GoPro. This and is going to be great for the well, viewers. No. It and was I totally cool. And I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I knew as soon as I felt like, oh, no, and like scrape on my knee, no big deal. I was more worried about the bike. Got the bike up, it was fine. And then we we're like, oh, that's going to be so sweet and slow mo. I can't wait to see that. <laughs> yeah, it, it must have looked worse than it was. Like, I did notice I so. you kind of fell on your thigh, like, no, like, knee or bone falls, you know? And, but right. you almost kind of scorpioned a little bit. Like, it was just, I've watched it a few times now, and um, like ten. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so excited. No, to see that's, it. but I've I've said this. Maybe we had this conversation during the race. But if people told me when I started mountain biking that you will fall, I wouldn't want to know that. Like when Chip, I started mountain biking, and Chip taught me. I don't think he ever said, "Oh, you're going to fall, and you're going to fall a lot." But that's the truth of it, and um, you learn that falling's not that bad like you kind of learn how to fall better than other times i mean of course the surprise falls that are you know terrible that's one thing but i'm talking about the oh i did this little thing technically a little bit wrong and you know, i've had a lot of those that te have taught me a lot so anyway i i just wanted to say you're actually a really good mountain biker so when you <laughs> to know that you've only had a bike for a year or two for like two um, years yeah i mean those were some serious trails i put you guys on they yes. were a blast i have to say that was probably my favorite part of the race and i even then i was thinking oh no we've already done the funnest part and it's only an hour into the race like ah, oh, what am i going to look forward to now it's only like uh, 24 miles of trekking through wilderness you know right <laughs> you know funny enough the that yard sale trail that i was talking about earlier we saw one team i don't know if it was intentional but they rode it twice ah. so like they they looped it they came back up and then they did it again and i was like yeah i would probably do that too yeah well i have to say i was proud of myself on i think that was yard sale where there was a a hairpin turn that had a wooden thing feature on the oh the wooden turn that's the boss trail yeah oh, okay, that's the boss trail well anyway of course chip did it and i was not going to do it but then justin did it and i'm like well he's right in front of me I, i'm gonna go too and <laughs> i mean i yeah it was a lot of fun, it was fun. glad i did that, that was cool it was and, a fun and trail so justin i gotta give you props like you just got involved in adventure racing you just got a mountain bike what a, a couple years ago and we call you to like, we want to win, you know, you got to let's do this, you know. And so the, the, the fact like, I mean, and again, our, our podcast is usually educational in nature. And this this you give people hope that you can basically join adventure racing, do some orienteering, get good at nav, buy a bike. And, and all of a sudden in a sold out race, congratulations, Alan, sold out race you know, you're, you're hanging with the top teams and it's like, th th this is not a sport that you need 20 years experience. This is literally, you can join the sport, put in the effort, train and, and, and do really well in a short period of time. And, and so I don't know, so props to that. It's, it's a, uh, I, yeah. I want more and more people to get involved in this sport and not be intimidated that you can't do it. You, you can't get there whether, whether it's an all female team or all male team or solo team. It's like, you can do this. Uh, this is, I, I like to call it an intellectual sport. This is not about necessarily being the fastest. You really just have to be the best at nav and do okay on all of the um, the disciplines and you'll do really well. And and you you, you bailed me well, we, out a lot of times on nav. So thank and, you for your help. And you guys did great. We had multiple teams that had like day of, day before teammate changes. Um, one of them in particular was RVA Racing, who's normally Phil Dawson and Mark Walmsley. They've been racing for years. Yeah. Phil's flight, he was in Europe or something, and his flight got canceled, so he couldn't make it. So Mark just raced with his 22-year-old daughter. I don't know if she's been racing 
but they were the I think final team or or fifth place overall. Six teams cleared the course. They were one of the six. So I mean that's like all that's as last minute as it gets. The day before, hey, you want to do this race with me? Let's go clear the course. You know. Yep. But, but Walmsley is a Jedi navigator. So oh, yeah. He's if a you beast. show up at a Central Virginia orienteering club meetup and Walmsley shows up, you, you know you better go fast, or that yep. guy's gonna whoop you. Yeah. So one thing I'm curious to hear your guys' perspective of what was your thought when you came into the finish line and I told you you were second? Because you seemed pretty shocked by that when you came in. Yeah, you can start. Uh, what do you say? Um, well, we knew we were doing well, but um, you know, we knew that there were a couple of teams that we didn't expect to be able to overtake that we did. So um you know, that felt really good. And I think, you know, it's just that constant, um, the constant just impetus to just keep going and keep at the, the speed that you're going. Like we didn't waste any time in the transitions and we really tried to keep a good pace. Like our pace throughout the whole race remained pretty consistent. Like we kept running at the end and, um, you know, it might not have been, you know, as fast as some of the other teams, but we kept it consistent and we didn't make mistakes. And, um, you know, it was really cool that it paid off. So it was surprising, um, of course, in a good yeah. way, because we've had surprises in the other way, too. So um, yeah, I'll tell you, you didn't know this, but it wasn't a done deal. Um, Roman Jacque, um, who just won all male at Nationals. Um, Roman's had a hell of a year this year. I think his overall results this year have been like first, first, second, first, second, first, first. Like he's been killing it this year. He was plotting at the same time as you guys, but then you guys took different routes on that last section. And uh, and me and Glenn and Kevin were just watching the tracker, trying to figure out which one of you guys was going to get back first. And he just had the slightest of bobbles, but it took him like 10 minutes to correct it on the saddle. Um and once he fixed it, he got it in, but it was too late, and you guys were already back at that point. Cool. And I, I was also worried. Yeah, I noticed like... that. Oh, sorry. Oh, I was just said on the looking at the time splits the other day. He was about 20, 25 minutes ahead of us for the majority of the race up until that. And then finally in that final trek section is where we pulled ahead. And we had no idea. We were just out in the dark <laughs> trying to find flags. Yep. And, and they say in, in adventure racing, you know, if you want to go fast, go solo. And if you want to go far, go with a team. And this was a mm. short race, like relatively speaking, like, you know, compared to 30 or three days or eight days. And uh, Andrea and I are usually known as mm -hmm. expedition racers. Um, so I, I thought for sure that the solo, either the solo racers or the two person males or the solo females even, like they're going to smoke us because a lot of times teams are not as fast on the very short races versus the solo if, if they've got the complete package. So I, I was shocked because I thought for sure. I mean, I thought we were doing OK in co-ed because they're actually even though it was a USARA regional qualifying event, I thought there'd be 25, you know, teams trying to get to that because there's actually a prize purse of like 800 bucks. I thought there would mm -hmm. be a, a lot of teams in there that, that are co-ed and, and uh, there wasn't, but um, I, I, I thought I was hoping for like top five overall um, and, and to, to come in second in a race that sold out. It blew my mind. Yeah, no, it was an amazing job and, and awesome sauce. You guys came podium in the division too. So yeah, it was a good day all around here. We were a good ways behind you guys, but um, man, that was that was fun. Nice surprise to get on the podium for sure. So, what was the highlight of the race for you and your team, Jesse? Um, highlights were probably uh, the exchange of pirate jokes back and forth throughout <laughs> the race. Um, yeah, we that that kind of kept us going. Every time things would get quiet, we'd be like, "Okay, another pirate joke." Um, I think a highlight. For me personally was we we've been practicing uh some of the pace line work on the bike that i learned from dave ashley and shelly shelly johannison of 
you know, getting in a tight pace line, being very disciplined about that and drafting and, you know, your front front person pulls for two minutes and then peels off and goes to the back, uh, being very, you know, having very standard communication that passes up and down the line. The fr- front person is the eyes of the beast and looks for hazard. Speed is controlled by the person in the back who's going to, if there's separation, is going to call off and have everybody slow down a little bit. So you reconnect into one unit and then on, and that passes on up. And and that um, we, we practiced that a couple of times and that, that went really well. It just feels good to be on a, a bike torpedo um, altogether. Um, and then I think for me, it's just always, that's why I love Alan, this format of race where we get to go race in the dark and that transition sort of going from daytime to nighttime is just, uh, super, super fun. So I think those are our big highlights. What about you, Justin? What were your favorite moments? Uh, I honestly just, the the great teamwork that we had at various points throughout the race was just really inspiring and fun. Um, you know, like I said, I've, I'm still relatively new. I've done some teamwork. I've done a fair amount of solo races, but fitting in and, and slipping into the team and working with y'all was just such a highlight for me. And like the times when we had to, Hey, we think we, we know we're close but we got to double back and find it. Let's split up, like just maintain eyes and ears, but let's get online and go back and find the flag. And boom, we did that, you know, more than once. And just little things like that, uh, just seeing the teamwork, but also being a part of it in the moment was just super inspiring to me. And uh, I, I had this really interesting moment on that first leg. And I, you know, I was a little gassed because yeah, I live in Virginia beach. Uh, I don't get as many hills in as I should on the mountain bike. And I'm, you know, trying to keep up with the chip. And all of a sudden we get to a, a trail junction. Chip asked me, it's like, hey man, uh, are we, you know, are we gonna ride or left? And, and I was just in before then, I was kind of just like in the moment. I wasn't thinking, and then I realized like, oh wait, Chip Dot is asking me to confirm his navigation. And then I'm like, cool, yep, nope, we're taking this left there's the intersection. We're good. Keep on going. So from that moment onward, it's like, oh yeah, I'm actually doing backup nav for this ability. And it was just a joy, such a blast. Yeah, totally. Teamwork Mm -hmm. is, is the dream work. I very much appreciated it. Yeah. Like, like, like Jesse said, like you get your heart rate going and you make errors and it doesn't matter how good you are. You know, you're you're in the front, you're going and going and going. And, and of course, I got bad eyesight and I need reading glasses and all this crap. I'm like, I, I'm pretty sure I know where I am. But, you know, so, no, you 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 saved my ass many times during this race. So thank you so much for being back up. Of course. Um, keeping it all together and, and keeping me straight. Your highlight. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my highlight. Um, well, other than the finish, because that, that blew my socks off. Um uh let's see highlight um I, probably i think us working together solving the complex puzzles like alan was showing on the map that one that was down there on the stream i think it was like out of all the races where it's so easy for a team to go off the rails when they're not exactly as sure where they are you you can easily go i want to go this way and i want to go this way and you start arguing and all that i think we like legitimately said we're not where we think we are where else could we be let's recalibrate and let's move forward and and so those those were the wins when we 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 got un unlost <laughs> we got found or <laughs> refound ourselves um i think we worked really well as a team and like it's almost like the dopamine hit that alan was talking about when you find the cp but when you figure out where you are when you are not sure it's like yes like we did it even more and knowing rewarding. all yeah. the other teams are going to get just as screwed up as we are. But because of our experience and our teamwork, we were able to puzzle through the problem and solve it quick and get back on track. Those, those I think were the highlights for me. I think my highlights are similar, um, but a little more self-centered. <laughs> like I like when I've contributed something to what we are doing. You know what I mean? Like, um, there is one bearing that I was in front of us doing the bearing to the next point, and it was really spot on. And I was like so excited. Um, 
So that was one of my highlights. But the other highlight was not as self-centered. It was a group high. And it was at the end. Um, I don't remember which point we were coming to, but it was where we recognized that the moon was coming up and it was really red and huge. And we were around at least two other teams, maybe three. And I didn't feel like all of us like paused for a second just to see this beautiful sight. I mean, it was just like surreal how beautiful it was and how we were all like just in awe. Like it almost felt like we can't race for this moment in time because we have to recognize this beauty. So that was that was one of my other highs. But Alan, as a race director, what was your high? Um, for me, um, I, I'm going to connect two of them. But one is, um, so we, we work with a, a group called Emergency Response Training. There are medical coverage when we do races. My Probably my favorite highlight is that I paid him to sit there for 14 hours and he didn't do anything all day. Um, no, We had no injuries in this race. I think the only thing he did all day is he gave out two ibuprofen. Um, and the, the way I connect that too is my highlights a little bit connected to yours. I, I would be lying if I pretended that I knew the super moon was going to be that night and all those things and the weather was going to be amazing. But that ended up being a massive highlight for me because I basically spent all night, you know, in start finish and we were just watching it. And it turns out John, who was doing medical coverage, is kind of a an astronomy buff. And I was there with my wife and my 11 year old. They were they were, you know, helping out all day. So then John was like, well, actually, I think we can see the comet right now. So then he showed us which way it was. And if you look in the race photos, I put it in the race photos, you can see it's like a purple sky. And then you just see the trail of the comet coming off of the uh, trees. Uh. And I was like, man, I've never, I've never really just been able to see that kind of thing before. But what I had heard is kind of a little bit of what you kind of mentioned. I did, I do intentionally try to send people to some scenic spots. And the very last checkpoint, checkpoint 53, was on a cliffside. It overlooked Pohick Bay. My thought was you could look over Pohick Bay. Not in my wildest that I realized the super moon would be across the bay <laughs> from everybody. And so many people in the race were showing me pictures at the finish line. They all stopped to just look and take a picture of it. And they were just like how amazing it was. Um, and that just, it worked out perfectly. And I felt like we needed this one because we've had like three or four races in a row now that have been rain soaked. And this is the first time in a while we've been dry. And boy, it was perfect weather for this race. Yeah. Here, here. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm proud of us because a lot of times when you ask people their highs, they give you their lows without even <laughs> realizing yeah. it. None of us talked about a low. <laughs> Do we even need to add that in this podcast? I don't know. <laughs> or, or, don't know. and again, we try to keep it educational. So maybe, maybe we end on, is there anything you did this time or, or what did you learn from this race that you're going to do different next time in your next race that you can share with everybody so that they, they kind of learn from your mistakes. Let's start with Justin. Oh man. Great question. Um, Honestly, it's the next time I would like to do a little bit better. Like, hey, when we get ready to go, I'm going to put my pack in a trash bag or a dry bag or whatever the case may be. I'm going to grab my gloves, which I forgot on the second paddle. And just little things like that, just like slowing down to speed up like we said earlier just going through that stuff in advance and like cool when i get to this spot in the race this is exactly what i'm going to do um that expression like you when when stuff gets bad you kind of resort to your highest level of preparation something to that effect i think that's what i'm getting after is like sure you can trail run you can bike you can navigate all you want but planning for those small moments uh, which add up to bigger moments during the race i think that's worth it that's what I'm going to look to to do better next time. Jesse, how about you? Oh, boy. Uh, I think my big takeaway for this race is going to be more attention to detail. So the I had some challenge with the bike nav with the directional trails. And that was one part, uh, being a little older and needing reading glasses and sort of being like, ah, okay, I'm going to be able to see this easily. And I had... Safety glasses that have the little bifocals in, 
they're a little bit amber tinted. Well, suddenly I go into the woods and it's dark and I couldn't easily see the little directional arrows on those trails. And then when we got to the trails, there were people standing in front of the signposts that said they were directional because everybody's milling around trying to figure out which way to go. So um, two things up for the visual thing. Uh, I picked up a new pair of better glasses that are clear so I can see what I'm doing. But the other is just um, suppressing that adrenaline, slowing down and going, just here's the fine point of navigation. We need to be slow here and be accurate here. And then we can pick up the pace later or like between those decision points. Man, that that resonates with me so much on, on everything you just said. Um, <laughs> but my my high or my uh, different would be specifically on the reading glasses. So on these races, I use the, these glasses. I used to use like um, almost like construction glasses, but they fit your face mm -hmm. too well because they're there to stop sawdust from hitting your eyeballs. But at the end of the day, it fogs up, right? So I started getting these like rimmed glasses with the with the bifocals, and um, I think I was using two or two X or whatever, and it wasn't enough. And so even though yeah. it wasn't raining, it wasn't foggy and everything, I'm trying to read the map. And there's like little nuances that I really still couldn't see. I, I definitely, I just ordered on Amazon more because they're cheap. Like they're like three for $20. But I kept having to ask Justin and Andrea, like, can you look at this map and tell me about this? Like, I, even my, my old, I'm getting older and older. I need bigger and bigger readers. But either way, for those of you out there that have eyesight problems, Amazon has readers like where it's, it's clear on the top. If you have a cataract replacement like I have and you have readers on the bottom. And 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 they and they stand off your face so they don't fog up as much. So um so I ordered two point two fives and two point fives and I'll tell you on the next podcast how they work out. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, well, and real real quick on that note, just since we're on the topic of vision, um, so I know this is a podcast, but I also picked up so with the safety glasses with the bifocals, that's great on the bike when you got good airflow, but when trekking you're not moving fast enough to clear the fog sometimes. So I picked up these, which are like map readers. They just have the bifocal part, but they're open air up top. So I figure for the trek where I'm less likely to get poked in the eye by a, a stick, uh, I'll, I'll leverage these. But again, uh, they just came in. So we'll have to tell you next time how it went. And where did you get those from? Because that's a European brand, right? Like you don't just yeah, they, you get those on Amazon. They came from Germany. Yeah, they came from Germany. Unfortunately, not on on Amazon. Um, I, I, it'd take me a second to look up the brand, but they're they're map reading bifocals, open air. Um, Maybe we can put the it in the search show for. Notes. Put it in the show notes. Perfect. Yeah. That's right. You guys are sophisticated. I like it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we try. Uh, my learning on this race was a lesson that I seem to need to be learning over and over again, is to just. Um, do the things I know that I should do. Like you guys are saying, like just slow down a little bit to do the right things. And so you know, like I left one of the TAs um, with my helmet still on, on the trek. I'm like, what am I doing with my helmet? And then Chip's like, well, you can go take it back. And I was like, no, that'll take me 30 seconds <laughs> or something. It just wasn't very far back, but I should have gone back and put the helmet back with my bike. Well, I shouldn't have made the mistake in the first place. And I probably made the mistake because I was trying to go too fast. And then I should have taken the extra minute to go put it back because I had to carry that thing, the whole trek and the paddle till the next bike. And it had my headlamp with the battery on the helmet. So it actually adds kind of a lot of weight. So that's slowing down. And another thing that, um, like I'd already said in the podcast, um, we didn't know the clue for that one point that most of the time I was keeping us all aware of what the clue was because I had the clue sheet. So I'm naturally the person that should have said, this is what we're looking for. Um, but I had that sheet tucked away. I usually have it connected to my backpack with an S hook and it's in a mat bag, like a smaller mat bag itself. And, um, but this time it was just in a plastic bag that I had in my pocket. So I'm not going to do that again either. I want it to be more accessible um, and things I should already know. But those are pretty detailed things that I want to do better with. So before we kick it to Alan for uh, the race director perspective on 
uh, learning. One more thing just for everybody. And a Alan, I got to give it to you. This was really cool that you mid race, they, there was no TA bends in this race. You basically said at some point during the race, you're going to pass nearby or some word your vehicle and you're welcome to use your vehicle for a transition or transition bend and our team went back and forth like do we drop all of our lights and half the food and everything and we take the chance by coming by or do we just carry everything with us and just do this as one race non-stop through um i'm really glad that andrea talked us out of doing any type of transition because it, it probably would have taken 15, 20 minutes to go in to get the vehicle and out. And so that was another thing that as, as racers look at their races and come up with their strategy, race directors throw out these little tricks of like, you can stop by your van. You're going to be close by. And then all of a sudden, you know, you blew 15 minutes going in and out. And, um, and, and we're learning more and more that um, you can skip transitions like you can, you can actually like with, with nationals, it was like 30 hours of shit on your back. That was it. You're done. There yeah. is no transition, Ben. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think a lot of people get, get wrapped up and I can only go this far and then I have a transition and I waste 20 minutes and then I move forward. So if you want to speed up your race, skip transitions. <laughs> like It's like been racing. Yeah. Actually. They probably came up with it first on their podcast of like, we're just going to go through the transition. We're not even going to stop. Well, the interesting thing with it, too, is I have learned, and this is this is from being a race director, that oftentimes I realize the race directors aren't really trying to guide you to do something so much as they're trying to guide you to not do something. I learned this. The, it's been like two or three years now. I did a race where they said the paddle bag has a 40-pound limit. And our team took that as let's get as much shit as we can in the bag until it's 40 pounds. And all the race director is trying to do is save his volunteers from having to carry super heavy bags. So he's putting a limit on it to stop you. He's not saying you need to put 40 pounds worth of stuff in your bag. He's just saying, please stop at 40 pounds because we don't want to have to carry it. And when it came to saying you could stop halfway through, I did that because there were a lot of teams who have not done longer races. And they're so worried about, am I going to have enough water? Am I going to have enough food? And I know from doing races that like, like you guys, I could probably do a 14 hour race without a transition area. Like I could put enough stuff in my bag and I could go through it. There are some people who just have that fear that I need to like help them with that. Look, if you need to access your cars, you can access your car. But that's, I think on one of the sheets I said, but this is optional. <laughs> it's like you don't need to access your car. I was trying to help with that, but I do, I, that's, like I've learned that over the years with race directors that they're often just trying to tell you really, please don't inconvenience us. Here's what to not do. Let's see. <laughs> uh, so I need to add a little something just to pat myself on the back. This is the very first time that I ate all of my food that I packed. Like I have like maybe half a cookie left. And I usually, my biggest fear is usually that I'm going to starve, but I didn't, <laughs> I did not starve. And yet I, you know, I took a little, Less food than ever. I ate it all. Yay me. <laughs> nice. When there's no transition, it makes sense. Like just minimum, like run out of stuff on purpose. Yeah. yeah. All right. So Alan, uh, wh what did you learn from race directing this race? And wh what were you, what are you going to do differently next time? Yeah. I mean, the funny thing is, I, if you know me, like a lot of people personally know me, um, I do obsess over my races so i do have like the next day i started writing down all the different things i learned i'm only going to give you one of them um, but i do as a race director I, it's the same thing as racing is the next day go oh, we could have did this how could we have prevented that um one of the things that i do catch myself doing as i become a more and more veteran racer is going of course that's where it is because that's where it's supposed to be and i'm like wait idiot beginners don't know that um you know like i have to keep reminding myself that there were, even in our 14-hour race, there were, I think, like 40 people who that was their first ever adventure race. So in the morning, I was still having to explain some things to some people. And there were two things that caught us during the day. One was the one-way trails in Meadowood. Um, you're going to love this story. Um, you're going to find out how, unfortunately, Awesome Sauce got a penalty and how this ability didn't get a penalty, but somebody thought you should have. And it wasn't just you guys. 
Okay. So in Meadowood, there are three mountain bike purpose trails. One's called the Boss, one's called Yard Sale, and then one's called Stinger. I had a checkpoint on Stinger too. I have been riding in Meadowood for over 10 years and have been completely oblivious to the fact that apparently it's a one-way trail. <laughs> I have been riding it in both directions for almost 10 years. And after the race, multiple one of them, but I would say three or four, I saw a bunch of people riding backwards on Stinger. And I was like, Stinger's not a one-way trail. <laughs> like, I was just like, I've been on it a million times. And then he was like, no, it definitely is. He's like, there's definitely a post there. It says, do not enter. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm like, dude, I've been riding. But I'm a trail manager uh, here in Northern Virginia, and I know the trail manager for Meadowood. So I reached out to him. And I was like, hey, is Stinger a one-way trail? And he goes, not as far as I know. He's like, it probably should be, but I don't think it is. And, but then there's there's two, two trail managers for Meadowood. And the second one chimed in, and he goes, it's definitely a one-way trail. I'm like, what? But I'm like, he goes, the problem is boss and yard sale have big giant metal signs that say do not enter. And then you go another 10 feet and it's like, do not enter wrong way. Like it keeps reminding you. And the reason for that is yard sale and boss are like super fast trails where stinger is a technical trail. So like they're not as worried about head to head con collisions. So at the end of stinger was this tiny little post that says do not enter. So it's like a trail post. You wouldn't even notice it. So for 10 years, I've been riding this trail the wrong way, apparently. <laughs> And what we did is I went and looked at the GPX data and we had almost like a 55, 45 split of people going one way or the other on Stinger. So I didn't bring this up and I didn't tell people like at the race because it really kind of wasn't worth it. But like, that's a moment where like, as a race director, you know, like I probably should have vetted it other than going, ah, I've ridden Meadowood for years. Of course, this is the way you go. You know, like I should probably like check that kind of stuff out. Um, so what we ended up doing is we didn't penalize anybody on that, but we did have a couple of people who went backwards on Bosch trail. Unfortunately, awesome sauce was one of them. So we did have to give them a penalty, um, because it was just, it was in the rules. It was on the map, but then I, I doubly learned the lesson because in the four hour race, usually with the four hour race, three hour races that we do, everything's usually pretty, pretty cut and dry, black and white. It's like, do this leg one, do this leg two, do this leg three. I decided to give them some strategy this year. And we said, look, you can do Gunston Hall first, or you can do it last, up to you. And then every, like, but then it was like, bike over to Mason Neck, do a paddle, do a trek, and then come back. And I guess when I said, do those whenever you want, a lot of people misheard that as, this whole race is a row gain. I can get everything in any order I want. And honestly, it kind of became a little bit chaotic. And there were a lot of teams saying like that team threw their bike down halfway through the bike and went and got the one that was 100 meters off the trail, even though it's a trek point. And like there was so much confusion. And eventually we just said, look, we're just going to leave it. No one cleared the course, but and everybody was very, you know, good spirited about it. But that's a lesson for me as a race director that I need to make sure that I control those kinds of things that could become a confusing element because with a four-hour race pretty much everybody i'd say 70 percent of the field is first timers and beginners so like they need much much more black and white rules like they can't be led to because a lot of them were like while i'm paddling can i shore up the boat and go in which of course if you've done my races before i have done that in races before so i can see why they would make that assumption so for me that's my lesson learned is just Hey, idiot, of course, not everything is perfectly clear because this is how I've envisioned it in my head all these years. And and you guys put out a, a race rules, you know, the the here, here's the book. And so I, I wish all race directors would put all the rules in the rule book and, and hand it out and say, those are the rules here. The volunteers don't don't elaborate. Just it's in the rule book or it's not. But also in the yeah. rules were the penalties for breaking those rules. And I love yeah. the rule books like that. Nationals did a really good job with that too. It's like, here's the rule. Mm -hmm. and if you break it, this is the consequence. So at that, that's really helpful. I, I started doing that because I, I never thought I would have to enforce infractions. Um, and quickly within, I think the second race we did, I, I quickly realized that whether intentionally or unintentionally, people are going to break the rules either by accident or on purpose. And I'm going to have to enforce them. So I can't just say, hey, don't do this, or we'll get you. Like, I have to be very clear, that's going to be a one-point penalty. That's going to be a five-point penalty, because that's severe. And what I always tell people is, like, especially, like, with the out-of-bounds stuff, 
when stuff's out of bounds, it's pretty much always out of bounds because it's either dangerous or it's private property. So we're either protecting you from getting hurt or we're trying to make sure some guy doesn't come at you with a shotgun because you're on his yard, you know, like, but so those are the things where like I put in my rules. I'm like, it is your responsibility to be in the correct spot and you're getting a penalty whether you did it on purpose or not. But it's clear in the rules and it's got a clear point value to it. That way it's not a let's debate if we want to enforce this one or not, you know. So yeah. no, good on you for doing that. Cause it, it, it's not a fun part as a race director, but I feel it's good to just be clear with it. And then it doesn't make it so that I'm objectionally deciding a penalty. I'm just like, look right there in the rules. It says, if you do this thing, you're going to lose a point. Yep. So thanks for being so transparent with um, your learnings on that. I, I really enjoyed your course and I thought every, you know, you attended <clears throat> the details really well and maybe we should end on what's next for everybody. Yeah, let's do that. So, What's next? You know, start with Jesse. He's got big stuff coming up. Oh, so next up, I'm I'm following my heroes off to another country, uh, going down to Ecuador. Team Awesome Sauce with JD Eskelson and uh, Tom Ambrose and uh, Megan Atuno. So that's coming up uh, right around a month from now. So should be good. World Championships. World Championships. Why are Cinchi in Ecuador? So exciting. Justin, how about awesome. you? I know you're you're doing a big move. Like you gotta get your family from Virginia to North Carolina, but you've got to have some races on the calendar, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, most uh about coming quickest, I'm making a new orienteering map and running an orienteering meet for Central Virginia Orienteering Club next month, like two or three weeks at Newport News Park in Virginia. So I'm still finishing up a map on that. Uh, as for races, probably going to try to hit up Winter Wildcat again and possibly Shenandoah Epic. Uh, talk to Alan, might be able to slide in on one of his broad road uh, off road teams, broad road off road. So, yeah, got to squeeze in at least a couple more races before I move down to North Carolina. And I know there's, I know there's some good races down there too. So, Alan, are you, you got any big races coming up or meaning you're so racing? Or, uh, yeah, so I'm I'm a little bit on a hiatus at the moment. Um, I injured my ankle at nationals. Um, so you can't see it on here, but I'm wearing a big old boot on my ankle right now. So I got to do that for a couple weeks, and then I've got to do some PT, and then I should be up and at them by winter, um, which will be good. Uh, the next thing for me will probably be something like Epic. Um, I'm also trying to convince Justin to come do it with Team Broad Run Off Road. We uh. We've actually won the the three four male division. I think two years running at Epic. So why not go for three in a row with that? But if I'm injured, I think Justin would make a great replacement for me on that team. Um, it sounds silly, but at this point, I think race directing is consuming a lot of my time. But I do that mean that in a good way. Um, part of the reason why uh, why I'm on and why I know you guys all so well, Justin and Jesse are both helping me plan next year's Spring Bloom. Um, which is going to be down at York River State Park with a 15 hour and a four hour. And I know people don't realize this, but like it takes a year's worth of planning to get to those races. So we're already many legs into planning that. And just before we jumped on this call, I was talking with somebody else about the fall foliage course for next year, which will be announced soon. Super excited that one. So you'll see about that soon. But all I can say is National Park Service related for fall cool. foliage next year wow good cool congratulations on selling out these races I and mean, obviously you're doing something right if every time you sell out so congrats on that um so yeah, thank you i i'm running out of boats and we rented 191 boats last weekend so wow <laughs> that is crazy that's awesome <laughs> yeah so what about you guys what's next for this ability yeah we are uh i mean we just moved to chesterfield virginia which is just south of richmond and so we've been kind of like the the, the this is like sorting your ta ben but it's like a penske truck that you're that you're sorting um so we're, we're we're finally like getting like your race was like okay we have to stop and get our, our everything sorted and get ready for ecuador so yeah we're going down to ecuador pretty early we're trying to do a tour uh with a bunch of other events race teams um for what about 10 days before the race to get acclimated and just you know do tourism and fun 
Um, and then we get back from Ecuador in December. We turn around in January and go to New Zealand for the, um, I can't remember. The, 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 Magnificent. the, the, Magnificent, the Magnificent. Yeah. That, that like has replaced God's own basically. And then like literally we come off the Magnificent right into Florida and do C to C. And so our it, normally this is the off season, but our race calendar is extremely booked with a lot of big races coming up. And so, um, so yeah, it's a little scary, but you know I'm getting old, so like let's let, let's check all the boxes as quick as we can. It's it's a really it's really an exciting life that we've managed to create somehow. I don't know how we got here. Well, I I do remember all the steps, but sometimes I can't hardly believe it myself. Um, but if you're listening to this and you're going to the world championship. I think there are still some slots on the tour that's being organized um, by Lewis Beckdash started the tour. And even if you're getting there as late as the 22nd, you can join us and uh, just let us know if you'd like information about that. And, um, and, yeah. and basically we're starting in Quito and, and we, we do some fun stuff all the way over to Cuenca. And then the the tour company because it's, it's not just Lewis he's setting it all up but it's through a um a tour company and they're they're going to get us basically from Quito over to the race and back all the hotels all the transportation everything is handled it's going to be affordable and we're going to have a lot of fun and there's training every single day so we're going to be you know, running or biking or whatever trying to get acclimated so if anybody that listens to this is interested just hit us up or hit up Lewis Beck Dash our teammate and we'll get you signed up for the tour. So yeah, thanks Justin and Jesse and Alan for being on the podcast and thanks everyone out there that's listening. Go have a great race. Yep. See you on the trail. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. Please take a moment to leave a rating and a comment. If you have a question for the next mailbag segment, call 757-354-4795 and leave us a voicemail or a text with your name, city you are calling from, and your question. To find additional content, including the video versions of these discussions, you can search for Disability Racing on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. We hope this podcast inspired you to focus on your abilities and plan your next adventure. See you on the trail.